Okay, that's great. Well, thanks very much to everyone who's attending this WFNS second webinar in the landmark papers in neurosurgery series. Um, it's uh, a pleasure hosting um, Thomas Antarius, who is a consultant and neurosurgeon at Edinburgh Hospital and the University of Cambridge today. Um, Tom has been a dear um, uh, friend and, and colleague uh, to me personally since I started in Cambridge several years ago. He's been uh, a mentor as well, if I may say. <clears throat> uh, in terms of um, introductions, I'll go through a few things. I mean, there are many important things that Tom has achieved um, as a trainee, but also when he was a trainee, but also as a consultant. So briefly in terms of his bio, he did his neurosurgical training in Cambridge, and then he gained additional subspecialist experience at the Mass General Brigham at Boston, UCSF, Montpellier, uh, and also other European centers. Um, notably, he did his PhD in cancer genetics under Sir Michael Stratton at the world-renowned Sanger Institute. Um, he is a member of the World Academy on Neurological Surgery, and, and as many of you know, this is uh, a very difficult club to, to get into. So, uh, And also he's an, a, a member of the Anatomy Committee of the WFNS. Um, his clinical interests are mainly on complex uh, neurosurgical oncology, and he also has a special interest in pineal region um, pathologies. Uh, and also he's interested in meningiomas, pituitary adenomas, and other skull-based um, tumors. Uh, you, many of you may know him through the Cambridge Lectures in Neurosurgical Anatomy, which he founded uh, more than a decade ago with uh, Mr. Kirolos, and he's still directing um, himself uh, currently. Um, Tom, uh, as I said, it is a true pleasure um, listening to you today, so over, um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Angelos, for kind introduction. I assume you can hear me okay before I get going. Yeah, it's it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I suppose the the question is uh, to drain or not to drain. So, um, you know, we won't be going um, through the history. You, it, it's all well to uh, well known to you that not only throughout the history but throughout the world. Um, trepanations were were performed, and uh, you know that there's there's lots of um, mystery about it, and, and probably will always be shrouded with mystery. And um, you know we need to take history um, with a bit of pinch and, pinch of salt, uh, you know, as Cushing recorded um, here in this comment of Johann Jakob Wepfer and other description, early descriptions of uh, chronic surgical hematoma. Well, although we will never know how common chronic surgical hematomas were um, in the prehistory or even history, um, we know that they are very common, you know, from your clinical practice. And given that people are going to live longer, um, chronic surgical hematomas <coughs> are only, only going to be more and more common. It is very important to appreciate some sort of details about um, the anatomy. Um, where do actually subdural hematoma occur? You know, where anatomically? Um, subdural space as such does not exist. Uh, subdural space, as many other sort of similar spaces in the body where fluids can accumulate, is, is a potential space. And essentially, what needs to happen is for the cells of the dural border cell layer, which is between the dura proper and the arachnoid proper, um, fluid needs to leak into it. And essentially, this can be either blood. Uh, from the draining veins and in theory arteries, but you know this is not that uh, common. It's mostly the draining veins that um, can can um, be torn between the areas where they are more fixed, either into the dura itself and the arachnoid on either side, or um, 
the subarachnoid fluid from the subarachnoid space can break through the arachnoid and fill the uh, arachnoid space, uh, sorry, it's the, the subdural space or the dural border cell um, potential space and, and um, create a space and initiate that way um, chronic subdural hematoma or simply lead to um, expansion and then traction on the frail uh, bridging veins and so cause um, hematoma. So this is this is similar drawing, black and white, a little bit simplified, but essentially some force uh, needs to um, tear the border cell layers apart. And then that's actually not that very difficult to tear apart, not least because when we actually create craniotomy, that, that's, that's pretty much we, we are separating uh, the arachnoid from the dura. And so then that's eventually blood leaks and you have a uh, subdural hematoma. So the etiological factors are trauma, uh, cerebral atrophy, tissue frailty, dehydration, coagulopathies, and the various iatrogenic um, interventions. So this is this is little schematic uh, representation of the etiology of uh, a chronic surgery hematoma. In the first instance, we have no problem, and uh, either hematoma or hygroma occurs within the uh, duodenal cell layer, as as I told you just now. And normally, um, healing would occur, and you know, in the end, you have no problem. Um, of course, even if the healing does not occur, uh, chronic subdural hematoma occurs instead. There you go, and we have a problem. So, um, pathophysiology, you know, specifically how what, what sort of um, happens exactly is, is remains unclear. You know why, in some cases. Um, the healing doesn't occur. It is probably because of poor absorptive capacity of the subdural space, i.e., the um, space within the dura border cells. So this is not like you know um, um, peritoneal cavity, for example. Imbalance of coagulation factors in the subdural space, ineffective inflammation. I mean, the purpose of inflammation is to take care of whatever problem there is and eventually lead to um, uh, healing um, so that the tissues in the end look exactly the same as they should um, look, repetitive bleeding and so on. Um, I'll touch upon the, the hypothesis of pathophysiology a bit later on, but um, clinical presentation now, um, there really isn't excellent or good quality rigorous study that would be designed to prospectively um, describe all the uh, presenting symptoms of a chronic surgical hematoma. So although um, there are a huge amount of papers on um, surgical techniques, um, I think if one wants to uh, do a tremendously impactful study in, in tremendously impactful journal, I think that's, that's one area to, to focus. I won't be going through that, it's, it's known to you. Um, surgical management, well, conservative and, and surgical, and the conservative really uh, should be reserved for asymptomatic cases or, or where the risk is uh, perceived to be very high. O over the centuries and millennia, there have been lots of surgical techniques and surgical tools developed, um, you know, from tiny holes through small holes to big holes or small big holes to big big holes and, and so on and uh, these are some of the terms that have been defined um, over the years. Um, there have been lots of add-ons to these techniques, um, you know, irrigation, no irrigation, intraoperative, postoperative, uh, um, breaking of membranes if you want to make money, you introduce endoscope, and call it a millimeter invasive or even keyhole if you want to, um, although we use the same burr hole as you do for putting the drainage in, in, in the classical burr hole drainage. So this, this, is, this is all happening. Um, and, and really this is, is mostly, mostly for um, searching for an ideal technique. An ideal technique has, uh, is a technique that is 100% efficient and 100% safe. Um, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a trainee, 
um, I've been thinking about is actually 2002, um, uh, the wedding that I attended with my wife um, in Athens. Um, I'm actually, my surname is not is Latin, not Greek, just in case you're wondering, but uh, I happened to be on, on a wedding in Athens, uh, probably under the influence of the Athenian um, sunlight that, that gave us democracy and tzatziki. It occurred to me that, um, um, you know, we really need to be using uh, drains in chronic subjugium tonus. Um, I was, I, was, I was mostly sort of looking at the recurrence and the fact that at our institution at the time, pretty much we didn't use drains at all. And, and here you have also the factors um, that um, contribute to recurrence and you know, very few of them are modifiable um, properly um, without causing some other troubles um, uh, apart from drains. So, you know, as, as you should do, um, uh, I went uh, to the literature and actually I was surprised um, how um, much the existing literature already was pointing towards us using drain. I came to, um, I, I was a I was junior trainee at the time, so, so I was um, approaching um, some of our faculty, you know, we should maybe use the drains. And of course, um, nobody listens to you as a junior trainee and, and they, they they send you to, to bring them some proof. And clearly the, um, you know, retrospective um, or, or semi-prospective um, series and so on were not good enough for them. So um, I, I had no choice then uh, um, think of uh, conducting a trial, um, you know, ourselves. And uh, this is really, which was the, the pendulum that swung into motion quite a, quite a few things since. Now, um, when the trial was um, underway, I thought it would be good to um, record uh, what's happening um, with the usage of drains in the context of chronic surgery hematoma in the UK. And at the time, um, you know, most surgeons would not use drains with chronic surgery hematoma um, most of the time. And our unit was pretty much here. So, you know, essentially that's how the um, question to drain or not drain um, it was embedded as the primary outcome um, for the chronic surgical hematoma. And, and specifically, it was at six months after surgery, is there a difference in the recurrent rates between primary chronic surgical hematoma, meaning uh, one that was not previously drained uh, with birth or craniostomy with postoperative drainage and primary chronic subjunctive hematoma treated with burhol craniostomy alone. So in other words, does the drain uh, make a difference? There were several secondary outcomes, which is mortality at 30 days and six months and modified rank and scale at discharge and at six months. Um, inclusion criteria were pretty much all CT proven primary uh, chronic surgery hematoma requiring drainage, so very sort of pragmatically real life based inclusion criteria. Here are some of the exclusion criteria which you can read about in the paper itself. And one very important exclusion criterion that, that was to be judged intraoperatively is, is it safe to use um, a drain? So again, it was meant to be a uh, sort of inclusion exclusion criteria for a trial that is run by common sense surgeon, not, not some sort of machine or, or vending machine even. So surgical techniques can be done on the general local anesthetic. In, in our unit, it happens to be most commonly general, but not exclusively. Um, 14 millimeter burr hole, um, just intra-optive washout, um, and placement of a subdural drain um, of, you know, I spent a lot of time looking for the right sort of drain. Eventually I settled down into, um, you know, mass produced drain that sort of pretty much well satisfied what I was looking for. It had to be um, of the right sort of caliber, not too thin, not too thick, uh, soft, not too rigid, 
the tip has to be smooth and the holes um, also have to be fairly smooth. You don't want to be pulling it out and, and causing laceration of, of either brain or the um, appeal vessels. So the results um, you probably are familiar with, um, the drain group had reduced a recurrence rate um, as compared to um, the non-draining group at um, six months. And but also there were um, sort of functional outcome um, differences that 30 days, not really statistically significant. Of course, you know, you can see that the 4% uh, mortality versus 8% mortality in drain and non-drain group respectively. And at six months, pretty much the same sort of ratios, but um, because the numbers are bigger at six months, this is more significant. And also of the people who survived, um, the uh, modifier ranking scale has also been significantly better at uh, both discharge and uh, six months. So clearly the drain is doing something. So we kind of um, looked at even more troublesome sort of cases. Um, um, in eye treatment of recurrent um, uh, subjural hematomas. And uh, we classed together uh, those that received the drain and those that did not receive the drain. And the drain could be either external or internal. We call it subdural peritoneal conduits, which is essentially um, uh, shunt catheter from the subdural space to the intraperitoneal cavity. And, when the internal external drain uh, um, sort of cases were combined versus those that not received drain, the uh, recurrence rate was 11% versus 33%. And again, this was significant, even though the numbers um, are aware, were low. This was again, single center uh, study. Well, as you know, um, clinical trials are expensive. This is, this is one little article um, that I found before giving a talk um, in 2017 or something like that in, in Brazil, I think. And you, know, you can see that, um, you know, 15 years of trial estimated $1.1 billion um, dollars were used on these trials. And, and these 30 trials failed to find a significant effect for treatments that were supposed, that are supported by extensive preclinical studies in phase one and phase two trial. So you can spend a lot of money and and find not a great deal. Um, you'd be very surprised probably, uh, particularly from today's perspective that really the, the trial received no funding. Well, no funding, you think, you know, cheap um, stuff, you get cheap rubbish result, perhaps they are some made up and and you know you are perfectly entitled to be skeptical. Perhaps you should be skeptical. Following the you know first slide, an example of Cushing and, and any uh, respectable scientist. Um, but um, you know Tom Field and um, when he wrote this uh, uh, piece of uh, news on my mother's birthday in 2017, said most scientists can't replicate studies by their peers. And uh, although you will not find my name among the authors because I didn't um, take part in this study, um, so the study is not biased um, in any way by me, this um, multi-center uh, prospective UK observational study um, found, um, yeah, there you go. Uh, found uh, that if noise drain is used, there's higher recurrence and um, higher uh, unfavorable out outcome. This was based on 1,200 uh, patients in 26 neurosurgical units. So um, it is not a single center study. Um, there are a large amount of patients. It is as real life study based as you can have it. And uh, voila, the results are pretty much um, identical to the results of, of the trial. Um, 
if the, the recurrence happens, if the drain is used um, eight, eight percent of cases, they use nine percent of cases. If no drain is used, then seventeen twenty four. Well, you know, it's slightly different, but but um, pretty much um, you know very similar. Also, we decided to look at the trial cohort um, ten years later to see you know is there any long term uh, benefit of using drain? Indeed, there is. Um, the drain cohort have better um, survival. And in fact, if you, if you look at uh, the drain group and compare them to general population, you will see that they have uh, pretty much similar uh, survival as those who have never had chronic surgical hematoma, whether those uh, that were treated without drain have significantly, and, and, and you can see the, look at the p-value here, significantly lower survival uh, than expected, i.e. when compared to the general population. So it's one thing to do a trial, and another thing is um, for it to percolate to uh, clinical practice. Um, um, uh, Mr. Walsh and his group from London had a look at um, their data in terms of um, recurrence uh, with drain and without drain pre-trial and post-trial. And, and, um, and you can see that the re-operation, I mean, actually here we have, you know, how often um, um, drain were used, the, the black is drain, um, and how often uh, before the trial and after trial. And this slide shows you the recurrence rate um, when the drain is used, not drain. So the, another independent study pretty much showing, you know, the same, same numbers um, as you, as we had in the original uh, trial. So, you know, th there is, there is, um, it is a real phenomenon, um, you know, undoubtedly. Um, and that's their conclusion. The use of surgical drains now unit, which means the London unit King's um, reduced recurrence rates following drainage of chronic surgical hematoma and reproduced the results of the 2009 clinical trial. Um, so yeah, we, we, we have written um, all sort of uh, experience and views and the review of literature in, in, in the seventh and um, now coming out eighth edition of the Yeomans. Um, if you want to um, uh, see how you know, we do typical burr hole craniostomy for um, evacuation of chronic surgical hematoma with, with, a, with a drain, um, Ashwin, Carrie has um, recorded a, a video which um, you know might be useful because I think the technique does matter. There's one thing is to say the drain is reduces it reduces the recurrence rate. Um, yet another thing is to stick the drain uh, into the brain or you know stick the drain in and then the drain will be blocked and uh, you end up with having a bit of plastic inside the subdural space rather than drain. So. Um, you know, the answer, and that's a, that's a Cushing, I was, I was looking very hard and very long uh, on the inter internet to find a Harvey Cushing smiling, but I uh, found eventually one. And, uh, you know, as you can see, he's smiling because he found an answer for the dilemma, whether to drain or not to drain. And yes, you can um, you know, produce lots of goods, even without necessarily spending a lot of money. So this trial I just looked up yesterday, and the um, the original paper has been quoted over five hundred times, and you know so you don't need a huge amount of money, but what you what you do need is is good colleagues and friends. Uh, these are those two people who uh, spend most of most hours working on the trial. It is now successful plastic surgeon uh, Dr. Ling um, in Singapore now and. And Professor Ganesan um, in Kuala, La, Kuala Lumpur, and, and we spent you know long hours into working into early early hours, um, just um, collecting and um, analyzing data of the trial. And then of course, um, there's, a, there's our great um, uh, chairman and uh, facilitator of, of lots of good things, um, um, Hatch. Who, without whom this would just never, never been possible. And um, 
you know, um, Angelus made a, some fantastic, uh, well, kind introduction uh, uh, to me. And, um, you know, it was great to see him um, growing over the years into uh, an independent uh, surgeon and great clinical scientist. And, um, you know, this is one of um, the papers that um, him, Hutch and Ellie Edelman uh, led um, is looking at looking at uh, dexamethasone, the role of dexamethasone in current surgery hematoma. Um, Angelos will know that um, I've always maintained that chronic surgery hematoma is mostly about um, anatomy, physics, architecture, less so about pharmacology. Nevertheless, it was an important uh, important question to tackle. So thank you for your attention. I have to mention that uh, Cambridge is not only um, sort of a place uh, famous of the old uh, uh, buildings of the university. There's a there's a uh, there's also a city in which uh, Pink Floyd uh, grew up. Um, in fact, they, they grew up on the same road that I live now. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning it is because of this particular album. And because of, uh, uh, I want to encourage all of you not to just keep repeating uh, what other people are doing and saying, but always question things. And then not only your life will become fun, but also you have a great opportunity to uh, change the world for better. And when you think, if you think it's all been done, it has not been done, there's a huge amount to do. Just open your eyes and you will see. Thank you very much. Tom, that's, uh, that's great. It was uh, fascinating. Uh, many of the things that you mentioned there hadn't listened to before. So uh, that was really interesting, especially about the, the conception of the idea uh, during uh, the, the wedding in Athens. Yeah, so if you guys want to have a good idea, then you need to go on a wedding to Athens. <laughs> that's great. Um, so let's just see if there are any um, questions from anyone. Uh, if there are, please feel free to unmute yourselves and then just ask the question. Anyone, any questions? If not, I can kick off with one. Again, don't, don't, don't be shy, we're all friendly a lot. Um, all you have to do is just unmute yourself and uh, yeah. show yourself on a video. Nobody's going to bite you. There are no, no bad questions, no silly questions. Exactly. Tom, if I may ask, uh, I guess you know, if I start, people might just become a bit less um, shy. But I mean, do you think, is it worth doing randomized trials? You know, you, you've been through, um, you know, some... Um, you have done yourself some major REM studies, a couple of them, randomized trials. I mean, at the other day, is it all worth it? Should we be doing randomized trials or as surgeons or, um, you know, just collect some data, do some observation studies and publish those and, you know, that's about it. Is it worth it? Well, that's a good question because, um, you know, there's one thing to do a randomized controlled trial for, for drug and uh, yet another thing to do randomized control trial for a um, uh, surgical technique. Um, one has to be very careful um, because there are numerous factors um, that can drown the significance of, of, of a technique. In, in fact, it is very difficult to even prove in a prospective study, i.e. sort of at a lower level of evidence that certain component of a technique or, or a certain technique or, or certain tool um, can be useful. And I think uh, partly it is um, because there are two um, very um, influential factors, um, uh, uh, both a part of a surgeon. Um, you need to, first of all, have good indication and then good execution um, of, um, of certain intervention or use of certain tool. And of course, you know, this is not to um, sort of be condescending in any way, but you know, there's a widespread 
of of um, uh, of quality of search and so or, or being you know how people are in, how people are informed um, about how to is it indicate for surgery and how to execute surgery, and the chronic surgical hematoma is relatively um, simple, um, technically simple, meaning um, that there are not many steps. In 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 doing chronic surgical hematoma, it does not mean it's simple in a way that um, it should should be done without undue respect and care. Um, I'm sure we have all seen um, misadventures with really bad consequences in chronic surgical hematoma. So the answer is yes, um, but there is no need. Uh, don't necessarily rush into a trial in every case under any circumstances. And equally, one must not disregard the information one can learn um, from a well-designed, well-designed, well-controlled uh, cohort study, for example. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I, uh, yeah. now, if, if, if you look at the chronological human tumor, for example, mm. um, you know, you could say that the uh, cooperative um, study was of a lower rank, yeah, because it was not a randomized control trial. Yet, in the context of the already executed randomized control trial, it actually delivered, I would say, even more valuable uh, information than the trial because it was a multi center, yeah. real life um, study. It's almost like a phase four um, study, isn't it? You know, that's yeah. looking at long term. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, excellent. We have a couple of questions on the on the chat about the first one is by uh, Beb Severim, uh, Cesarem about the uh, so in in your practice, what proportion have intra brain expansion, therefore uh, negating the need for a drain? And the second question by Christine Mitoko is about the benefits of subgalial versus subdural drains. And I guess, you, you know, you could possibly, possibly answer both of these questions uh, at the same time and perhaps give us a brief yeah, summary yeah. about, yeah. you know, your, your current practice with regards to subdural drain insertion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So before, before I even go to the practice, uh, I'll, I'll try to kind of, let's, let's think about what we think is happening. You know, why, why is even the subdural hematoma happening? It's mostly because um, of the growing discrep number one, the growing discrepancy between this skull, which is rigid and doesn't change, and the brain that shrinks. Second, frailty of all tissues, including the connective tissue, i.e. the dual bordal cell, and the bridging veins that travel through it. So the, the probability of trauma is greater. Thirdly, brain um, elasticity and um, brain fl uh, fluid content um, is, is decreasing. So you end up with smaller, firmer, less elastic, less pulsating brain. And um, then when surgery so hematoma occurs, um, particularly when it's there for a long time, you end up with a brain that is shrunk and many of brains like that will not expand intraoperatively. So the majority of the brain in the elderly population that we see will not expand, you know, intraoperatively like in front of your eyes. It's of course different if you have a uh, chronic subjective hematoma or subjective hematoma um, in a um, 50 year old or 40 year old where pretty much you um, you make a burrow, open the jury up, boom, uh, you know, the subjective hematoma squirts away, you wash it out, but when you wash it out, and by the time you wash it down, essentially the brain will be at the at the dural surface. Yeah, so you will not be sticking brain a drain into that um, because number one, it's dangerous. Number two, um, that pretty much is very little point in doing this. The reason we're putting putting the drain in is because we we're helping the brain to expand, and it takes um, for this um, rigid small. Um, poorly hydrated brain, it takes it, takes it a while to expand. And, and what the drain does, it pretty much, with every pulsation of the brain, a degree of the fluid gets uh, pushed through into the, into drain, 
and, and usually doesn't return. So push, no return, push, no return, push, no return. And, and this really helps uh, re-expanding the drain. So, um, you know, if, if the brain doesn't expand, some sort of drainage is helpful. Um, subdural probably is, 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 is better, but, you know, if you, if you can achieve <clears throat> um, drainage, um, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you put the drain um, subgaily and, and the holes or whatever are in good communication with the subdural space, and you manage to hermetically close the skin and so on, you know, sub, uh, subgaleal drain can potentially, at least in theory, be as helpful as subdural drain. But my preference would be subdural uh, for a number of reasons, um, uh, but subgaleal, I, I think it's very good, um, a very good um, alternative if let's say we're worried for whatever reason sticking the drain into subdural space certainly if we have a, a wrong sort of drain for sure do you think that the um just a following question do you think that the length of the subdural drain that's in the subdural space actually matters you know some people for example you know they try to insert the drain all the way from the frontal hole to the parietal or you know um vice versa trying to span the whole convex, trying to cover the whole convexity with the uh, drain. Yeah, so, you know, some people um, stick the drain through the parietal hole, um, kind of thinking that, uh, I suppose, when the, when the person lying on their back, most of the fluid will be just kind of near the parietal burr hole and they will drain it that way. The, the truth is that um, a drain usually sort of assumes the shape of a pear, and usually the, the fat bit of the pear, you know, opposes the parietal burr hole and, and usually there's no fluid around the parietal burr hole anyway. Um, the way you want the tip of the drain is probably around the frontal horns. That's where the majority of, of the of fluid will be uh, accumulated. And essentially you want ideally the drain, um, the tip of the drain to be in a space which is likely to um, disappear last which will be somewhere um around the you know around here sort of you know um frontal um frontal convexity okay great thank you um are there any other questions from anyone can't see anything on the uh, on the chat No, there is a lot of. Who, who's that? Is that Adam? Yes, hello. Oh, hi, Adam. Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, Mr. Santaris. Uh, I, just, I, I just had a question on um, drain material, which you did touch on briefly. Um, people use EVDs or celastic catheters with extra holes cut in them and all kinds of things, but. What do you use and um, does it make a great deal of difference in practice do you think yeah no i think i think it in some cases it well again statistically yes it does a drain does matter in fact we ourselves are looking for an ideal drain i sort of, sort of designed the plan of an ideal drain but somehow i couldn't persuade any company to actually make it so there's no sun terrorist drain and probably never will be but um so so I think the the components of a perfect drain is the drain has to have a certain caliber. You know, in some cases where it, the fluid is pretty much pure uh, pure water and so on, something like EVD can be just fine. Um, but in some cases where it is more bloody and so on, it, it is more likely to uh, uh, clot. Also, if it is just EVD, then perhaps when it is secured or whatever, it can bend. And it'll be even narrower in, in certain areas and, and yet yet more likely to to block so certain diameter and certain sort of um viscosity parameters um are important for for the flow because because the fluid needs to flow otherwise otherwise it's a plastic not a drain second it, it has to be as atraumatic as possible so um you want it to be soft um, you, you, you want the tip and the holes to be 
smooth. So uh, one has to be a little bit careful when, let's say, cutting holes into um, some sort of fairly firm silastic um, uh, drain because, or just cutting the end, you know, because it, it can actually injure the brain either when inserting it or um, when it is removed. Um, so, you know, this is, this is kind of the characteristics of, of a drain. We, we have certain drain, which is okay, but it's not, not perfect. I think um, there's been paper published by the Danish group. Um, the, the Danish sort of group seems to be quite serious about uh, dealing with subdural hematomas. They have sort of a national consortium, and I think they've used the drain, which seems quite interesting to me. We, 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 we're yet to try it ourselves, so I can't comment from my personal experience, but theoretically it looks good. <laughs> it's been published in ACTA Neurochirurgica, if, if you want to look it up, can't remember the, the author's names, but um, uh, we, can, we can send it to the group if you're interested. Great, well, uh, thank you, Tom. Um, any other questions at all? Tom, are there any comments that you might want to make before we bring the meeting to a close? No, I'd, I'd just like to highlight that, um, you know, chronic subjective hematoma is, is a relatively simple technique. We must not underestimate it. Technique does matter. And particularly those fairly early um, in their training, um, I, would, I would urge you not to think of this as a okay i've done one or two you know i i can move on to i don't know mvd or something because this is boring no it's not um you know if if you think pretty much any operation in part from insertion of an icp bolt that it's that it's painful and boring operation i think you're in the wrong profession um you know you need to you need to treat every every operation with maximum respect and think how this can be done better and i promise you that you will enjoy whatever you're doing much more um yeah so so i i, I do believe i not only believe i I've, I've seen it and so it's not the evidence that i necessarily will ever publish but i've seen um even data on on subdural hematoma done done well and badly Excellent. Thank maybe, you. Maybe, maybe the la last point, yeah. one, that, one thing that is not thought of very commonly, um, and, and maybe you, you, you will see it in the video that I mentioned, um, which is part of, part of the yeomans as well, is um, particularly when the bone is thick, you may want to consider um, drilling the burr hole um, tangentially rather than perpendicular. Um, uh, to the bone surface. I think that's it. Yeah. Excellent. And also Thank most you. people, mo 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 the most common error in terms of putting burl is making it close to the midline. Lots of people just put it very high up close to the midline. Mm -hmm. the, the placement of the burl is also important. Uh, the, the typical most, if, if, if you're not sure, that if you go um, at the junction of the uh, coronal suture and um, uh, superior um, temporal line, uh, probably you, you, you will place it in a good place. Thank you, Dom. I think these are all very useful um, tips and some very good messages about uh, not just chronic subdural, but also um, about trials and, and research. Um, so thank you very much for um, presenting today. Thanks very much for um, you know, um, giving us an overview of what led to this trial and not just the trial results. I think that's very important and it's very inspiring for um, young neurosurgeons worldwide. Um, so many thanks again on behalf of the WFNS Young Neurosurgeons Committee. And thanks to everybody who attended today. We'll upload the talk onto the YouTube channel so you'll be able to go back and have a look again if you're um, interested. Thanks again. Thank you very much for your invitation and um... You know, good luck to everyone and uh, wishing you all success and enjoyment of your career in, in the most uh, exciting your session. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.